It's dark out here. I'm inspired to make an anglerfish mask. So my very first thumbnail, I came up with this very plain Jane anglerfish. If an anglerfish can be described as plain Jane. But the idea is that you have to start somewhere. For my next design, due to some changes I would make later in this video, I decided to kind of do some kind of cyborg fish. Maybe he would be some kind of biological and technological crossover of some sort. Then the final idea that I ultimately decided to land on was this very clumpy, bumpy, organic looking fish. Now it's time to work on a color scheme. I eventually decided that I would go with a very exaggerated natural look. So I took some of the color scheme that the fish already had in real life and just kind of pushed it to the extreme. FYI, I will be toning down the final project so that it will not be this bright. One of the major features of this mask is that the anglerfish is going to have a glowing bulb. Here before me I have my wire strippers and I also have this harness for the LED light. I have a 9 volt battery and then I have another harness to connect that 9 volt battery to the harness for the LED. In this video I'm going to show you how to take this pile of components and make it a functioning light with a switch. My mother bought my son a radio at a thrift store or some kind of uh, flea market and and he loves cars, and so she bought him this radio that's shaped just like a car. And so uh, it was all damaged, it needed a nine volt connector. And so I bought one, uh, I, went, I went to Amazon to get one, and uh, so I ended up buying like 300,000 of them for about four cents. And I used that one to fix the radio, and it worked great. He was actually picking up stations on it. Uh, it's big really nice looking big body car and then uh, I think he destroyed the car obliterated it destroyed it knocked it into pieces in like like a day and a half but uh, I've had these things for years now so uh, I use them every once in a while so I'm going to show you you know how we can apply this to these LED lights and that way we have a portable power source for our mask uh, maybe 9 volts not good for you uh, they're cheap they're fairly light um, but you're gonna be wearing them on your face, so there are other options. So you could get watch batteries, things like that. You can also buy kits for that on Amazon. Okay, so here's my LED strip and my connector. I have already put it together off camera because I wasn't thinking. But later on in the video, I end up taking it apart and showing you how to do it regardless. So let me just take my wire strippers here and remove the plastic coating off of both wires. And I'll twist up the ends to keep everything nice and neat. Now it's time to dry it out. And voila. It doesn't work. This brand of LED harness came with a plastic connector at both ends. Once I realized there was some kind of issue with the connector, I decided to just clip it off and hardwire it in directly. Pro tip, what I always do is loosely put it together and test it real quick before I go through all the effort of wiring it up and closing it up for real. And I'm glad I did because after hooking it up, it still didn't work. I found out that the color coding was off. After transposing the posts, I saw that the lights came on. Red goes to black and black goes to red if you're using one of my Amazon battery connectors. The lights look nice and bright, but I guess we'll just have to see once we get it in the globe of the anglerfish. After swapping it around really quick and mocking it up loosely one more time, the lights worked perfectly. Now it's time to do it right. Let's get out the heat shrink. This is fantastic stuff that I like to keep around anytime I'm doing electrical work in my sculptures. I'm at home and forgot my heat gun. So today I'm going to be using a lighter. If I'm careful, it should work just fine. And careful is my middle name. Or something like that. So first we want to select the right size. We want to go with something that is about the same size as the wire, just slightly bigger. Because even though the heat shrink does shrink quite a bit, there are limitations to it. So you just want to go just above what you need. So I slip on the heat shrink, twist the wires together, and slide the heat shrink back over. Now that the heat shrink is properly covering the exposed parts of the wire, time to get 
Lit! And just like that, it's like magic. It's just that easy. Now that our harness is complete, it's time for another quick check before we wire this through our mask. And bingo, it works perfectly. So I just wanted to share this with you guys. I'm at home and this is my son. Currently he is taking a nap beside me and he has colored his entire body with markers. Showing great potential to become an artist one day. He's already being very creative. Okay, we're back at the workshop at school and we've got our LED and our wire. We've got plenty of wire and I've ordered a toggle switch to put on here so we can turn it off and on. In the meantime, I gotta do something about this unicorn horn. A student started this mask and then abandoned it here when he moved schools. He did a really good job, but this is just too static and lifeless and it's too thick. So I'm just gonna take a Japanese handsaw and chop it off. Whoops. Whoops, I didn't know it had armature wire in there. I hope it didn't ruin my saw. I should have thought of that in advance and used a Dremel tool. To finish this job, I'm gonna go ahead and use some tin snips. I really like this brand because they are cost effective and they cut really well. I'm gonna save this piece for later. It's a nice cone shape that'll make a tooth or a horn on another project. Now I just want to roll up the rest of this armature wire so that it doesn't hurt me or the wires that I'm going to be running through here. We want to be very careful because it is spiky. I want to use a gentle touch when I'm pressing this stuff down because the spikes can go into your fingers and that's an ouchie. Now I'm just mocking up this wire to see how it's actually going to fit. So we want this protuberant piece to rapidly start tapering down to the bulb. Now, to replace that little tip that I cut off, I found a really nice piece of flexible conduit on a lamp in my supply closet. I'm just going to take it all apart and set all of the pieces off to the side to be stored and organized later. There's a lot of good components here, waste not, want not. Whoa there, buddy, you're not getting away that easy. Although there was a lot of hidden treasure in that old piece of lamp, this piece of conduit is the main prize, and it looks like it's just the right size. Let's go ahead and secure it onto the mask with some expandable foam. As usual, I lost the little applicator that goes on the end here, and now I'm gonna have to be really creative to try and get this foam out of the can. Warning, the better idea would have been just to go to the store and pick up another can since I know I'm going to be using this stuff again later. I could have just used the new cap on the old can and then switched it over when this can was empty. Issue number two, I should have been wearing gloves when I was doing this. This was a complete noob mistake. After getting this cavity in the mask and my entire body filled with foam, I used a piece of rebar tie wire to tie this conduit in place while the expandable foam dried. I use this wire because it's cheaper than armature wire and you can get it at your local hardware store. Now I'm setting everything up to dry and I'm using the excess foam as texture on the face of the mask. I'm going to add a lot more texture later. Okay, so I'm gonna leave it like this to dry. Uh, one note uh, of warning, definitely, definitely don't you do this stuff without gloves on, okay? Uh, if I ever do something like this again, rest assured, I will be wearing gloves, uh, but this stuff adhered to my hand like crazy. Um, and so I've never used this stuff without gloves before, at least not uh, this intimately. And so it made a really like almost semi-permanent uh, scaly armor over my hands, which I thought would be pretty cool. I thought, you know, maybe it'd be nice for the, to have that the rest of my life, uh, however long or short that might be. Um, but I thought maybe my wife might not like it. So the best thing to do that I found was to let it dry and then kind of peel it off later. 
And so I don't know, is it, is it damaging? Is it gonna be bad for me? I don't know. But, uh, you know, subscribe. Check back in periodically, find out if I'm still alive. I'm just going to let the rest of the contents of this can spill out on this paper. Maybe we can use it later in art class. Now it's time to make a hole for our wire. Now I'm adding in a toggle switch that I purchased from our wonderful tech oligarch, Amazon. I'm just going to wire this up so there's an easy way to break and close this circuit. First I had to lengthen the wire on one side so that they would be even once I added the toggle switch on the other side. Now we're wiring in our convenient toggle switch so that we can turn our mask off and on. This is a trick I like to use when I'm running wires. I like to take a piece of masking tape. I will tape my electric wires to a piece of rebar tie wire and run it through the hole and use that as a way to feed my wires through. The tie wire is much more rigid than the electrical wires and that allows it to travel through tight spaces a lot easier. Once the electrical wires are pulled through I can remove the tape and get rid of the tie wire. Now that I'm back at school with all of my proper recording equipment I can show you how I take this roll of LEDs and hook it to the wiring harness. Step one, you have to find this little line and cut off how many LEDs you want. The next step is to peel back that little sticker so that you can make a good contact. Then you want to slide the copper portion underneath the two pins here in this connector. Close it up and you've joined the wonderful world of LED lighting. Now that all the bits are in place, all I have to do is mount all of this hardware inside the mask. So funny thing happened, I got all the way done wiring this thing up uh, and pretty well done with what I was intending to do with it for the most part when I decided to change directions completely. I thought, you know, I, I looked over at my old plasma globe that I bought originally as a prank to trick my oldest son uh, but uh, <laughs> into thinking I had superpowers. But uh, I have a, a plasma globe and it was starting to short out a little and starting to mess up. So I decided, hey, what if I could take and have the end of the uh, anglerfish's bulb be this plasma globe. And then it would look very organic because you got the lightning look to it. Yeah, it wouldn't look realistic, but, you know, uh, it looked very sci-fi, very bizarre. And it would be interactive where people could touch it and those little streaks of electricity would follow your finger around. So I thought, you know, maybe that's the way I want to take this thing. So uh, that's what I did. So I started taking that apart, uh, working on it, messing around with it. So let's watch that process unfold. After removing the four screws in the bottom of the plasma globe, we're starting to get to the good bits. I need this globe so I can have to figure out how it comes off. It turns out it's just kind of glued on. Now that the plasma globe has been disassembled, I have went ahead and put the wiring back through the mask just like I did the first time and now I've cut out little holes for all of our components to go in inside the mask so that everything will be in nice neat little components installed when I'm done. Also there will be a little port that you can plug this into the wall through so that you can leave it displayed and going without using up all of your batteries. Now I'm going to heat this housing for the batteries with my heat gun so that it can fit the contours of the mask better. But before I do that, I want to remove these little plastic tubes that the screws went through. These are a pair of side cutters that I'm going to use. You'll notice that this one has a little square notch cut out at the back of the jaw. When I'm buying a pair of side cutters, I make sure that it doesn't have that little square missing. This part of the jaws has the most leverage and is the best part for cutting, so I don't want it to be removed. 
To be perfectly honest, I have no idea what that little square is for, so if anyone does, please leave a comment edifying me. I would love to know about that little square that ruins a perfectly good set of pliers. Now that the plastic is really hot, it's very malleable and easy to bend into the shape that I want. Now I'm going to create the palette of the fish's mouth out of cardboard. I always save cereal boxes because it's a lot cheaper than chipboard and it's better for the environment to reuse things. I always start out by cutting out the rough shape a little bigger than I think I need and that allows me to trim it up to the perfect size. Once I get it fitted into place, I can secure it with the hot glue and then I have a nice structure to paper mache over. Now I'm filling some of the gaps in the mask with sculpture epoxy. Like all epoxy, it comes in an A and a B and you mix them together, then a chemical reaction happens. It mixes in a one to one ratio. The key is to judge how much you'll need in total and make sure you split the difference between the two, A and B. The common mistake I've noticed a lot of students making is that they'll get the whole amount they think they need all in A and then double it in B and end up with way too much left over. Wear gloves for easy cleanup and mix it until all the marbled effect goes away. You want a nice solid color when you're done to know that it is thoroughly mixed and the chemical reaction is going to happen right. If it's not thoroughly mixed, then some of the epoxy will never dry and nobody wants to wear a sticky mask. With the leftover clay, I'm going to make some teeth. I made some off camera, but these are not nearly enough. I made an entire video on how to create these teeth out of sculpture epoxy if you want to go over the process in more detail. This anglerfish is going to need some long, thin, creepy, needle-like teeth. I'm basically rolling out coils and then I apply more pressure on one end to make a finer point. Remember not to put on your gloves until you need them because they sure do make your hands a hot, sweaty mess. I got this epoxy from Amazon and it has several hours of work time so you have plenty of time to get everything perfect before it cures. Now while my teeth are drying, I'm going to go ahead and paper mache everything that I need to paper mache all at once. Once I get all of this done, it will have a nice and smooth facade and it'll be sealed for painting. Now it's time to make this thing look less like a horse and more like a fish. I always instruct my students to save the backs of their masks whenever they cut out the head hole because you never know if those pieces will come in handy for building extra layers and parts of your mask. I'm going to cut these pieces in shapes that I think will work and then I'll keep mocking them up until they fit. After that I'm going to have to extend out the eye holes so that we can actually see through this thing. For that I'm going to use a piece of recycled tubing. One man's cardboard trash is another man's cardboard treasure. Remember before using a saw always pay attention to where your fingers are at all times. Now it's time to fit these puppies into place and I'll secure them there with a little bit of hot glue. That'll keep them there nice and strong until I can cover them up with paper mache. Whenever I apply hot glue, I always try to be very wobbly and inconsistent. And perfect. You know, I used to date a girl that looked like this. Maybe one more haphazardly applied application of glue. Inconsistent. Now I'm just reinforcing this thing with a little more hot glue here and there. The next step is to cover up that muzzle and make it look more like a fish. So I'm going to just hot glue my pieces in place and then I will come back over it with paper mache. Wow, look at that technique. Sometimes I use the handle or the blade of my knife to get into those hard to reach places. Now I'm finishing up the paper mache in the mouth and I'm just going to make this one solid layer going all the way over this piece. I 
I'm being careful to make sure I wrap it on both sides of the mouth. I was trying to be careful, but I noticed I was getting glue everywhere, and since this is electronics, I decided to go ahead and stuff all these electronic components into a zip-top bag so that they would be protected from the water and the glue. There we go, sleep tight, my lovelies. Now all I need are about 3,000 more layers of paper mache. If you're a careful observer, you'll notice that I'm kind of folding up pieces and wadding them up and covering them. That's because I'm taking this opportunity to go ahead and fill in any dents or gaps. There are some fundamental truths to reality, and I think one thing we can all agree on is that a mask just isn't a mask without eye holes. Now that we lovingly ripped eye holes into this mask, we can come along with some more paper mache and kind of refine the look. For me, creating is a process that gets pretty fluid, so I decided to make a tail on the fish. I used more trimmings from the back of other masks, and that did the job quite nicely. I'm tack welding it in place with a little bit of hot glue. For me, hot glue is usually just a stopgap measure. It's a temporary thing. You guessed it, it's time for more paper mache. This makes my fishy nice and strong. Every self-respecting anglerfish who's worth his salt is going to try his utmost to have fins. So we're going to mix more sculpture epoxy and we're going to create some. I'm laying out the ribs for the fins and then I'm going to use a silicone sculpting tool to help articulate some of those lines in there. As you'll see, I'm going to be using a lot of ceramics tools to kind of mess around with this stuff and manipulate it till I come up with the shapes that I want. As you can see, I'm putting a lot of effort into constructing these in the right shape and making sure they're put together right, but one of the things that really concerns me is the flow. I want to make sure that my lines flow in an interesting way. You'll also notice that back and forth progress of making things better and tearing things up. The flow of these lines going forward and backward are very important to me, but since this is a 3D piece, I also have to consider the flow left and right. So I scoured the area for objects that I could use to prop up the fins in certain areas until they dry. 
Also have to consider whether the fin's going to fit the contours of the mask once it's dry. Now after our little skeleton has dried overnight, we're ready to put on some flesh. I wanted some of the fins and other features on this fish to be kind of transparent to mimic that deep sea creature look. So I'm going to use some tissue paper mache. In my experience this works really good with a polyurethane, but since I don't have any, I'm going to use more Elmer's glue. It's a bit finicky. It reminds me of trying to put gloves on a toddler. Step one, try to get good coverage over this sculpture epoxy armature. The second step involves me mushing down this tissue paper in between the little ribs to make it look like there's indentations. Look at this fantastic paper mache corpse. It works. Now let's focus on fit and finish. I'm going to use some electric tape to hold this plasma globe in place. It will also act as an armature for the paper mache, but first we'll use it as a barrier to keep this electric wire off of this metal. One last test before the two become one. That works for me. Time to wrap this thing up. This should insulate the wires from the foam and paint, and it'll also give us a base. It was looking a little lopsided, so I decided to make some filler out of leftover trash and tape it into the mix. One more test before we go any further, and it seems to be working quite well. Now it's time to add a little more texture before we paint. It's time for a little more wacky foam fun. As you can notice, this time I'm wearing gloves. Learning the hard way. I think the key is to lovingly apply this foam and just slather it all over this fish's face. Don't forget the tentacle. Now that we've applied the texture, it's time to put on a layer of acrylic paint to seal everything and make everything one solid value. There were some pinholes, so it's going to take another layer. When acrylic paint dries, it shrinks and sometimes leaves openings. I wanted to make our fishy friend orange. We'll do that by mixing red and yellow for you Art One students. When I was doing research and looking for reference photos, I noticed that a lot of anglerfish were orange, so that's what we're going to do our base layer of color in. As you can see, it's transparent. The paint is not very opaque, probably due to the yellow paint. It's hard to get opaque, pigment-dense yellow paint, so it's going to take a lot of layers. Next up, I'm going to try to match the blue tissue paper that we used on the fins so that I can paint his little tentacle feeler lure thingy. I'm probably going to need to do multiple layers on this as well due to the acrylic paint drying, so I'm going to store it in this baby food jar. If you were one of my students and you need to save some paint that you mixed up for later on on a project, just let me know. You can also utilize these very special, famous, wonderful 2022 model baby food jars. So yeah, I accidentally broke my uh, my bulb for my for my fish. So 
that point, uh, the whole day was cursed. I accidentally cut my hand three times, twice trying to clean up a table, uh, and once I cut it on a ceramic uh, kidney. It's not even supposed to be sharp. Uh, and I had all just everything that could go wrong was going wrong that day. Uh, I'm not going to bore you guys with it, but at that point I was just defeated. Um, yeah, so I just, uh, just sitting on the floor of my bathroom trying to rethink my life. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll just uh, try to make my backup one work. If not, I'll have to buy and order another one and we all do all that attaching. But the good news is um, there were some things I didn't like that were going on with the mask. Uh, I was getting the, um, the little beep off the head. It was getting a little too thick at the end. I wanted to taper down quicker. So now, uh, I, I, now that I'm doing this, now that I've got to redo all that, uh, I get to do it right. So that's a really a good thing. Okay, more calamity just struck us. A couple of my students were playing around with my mask and uh, they tore some of the wires loose. So this marks about three times that I was nearly close to being finished and now I'm back like starting halfway over again. Uh, I will finish it, but we're gonna have to have a part two to the video. Um, and we'll just have to see what other crazy stuff happens. What new problems will arise? Will the mask get completed and this be a triumph? Or will it all end as a spectacular failure? Ending with Mr. Jones having to live in a hole. Tune in next time to find out.